He planned to keep me alive while he cut me up and ate me. Three extreme creepy stories of Reddit r slash let's not meet, about intruders, cannibals, and a naive waitress. I was home alone. This messed me up for a while and I'm still not completely okay, but it's easier to cope. It was the middle of summer and my parents had left for the weekend to go to our house in the Cape Cod. It's about a two hour drive away so it's no big deal for them to leave me alone for a few days. My mom had made some pulled pork and pasta for me to heat up to eat whenever and I had some money if I wanted to order a pizza. Things were all good, the first night I was alone, I stayed up till 3 in the morning playing Xbox so I woke up really late the next day. I checked my phone when I woke up and saw it was a little past 1, I had made plans to play some street hockey with my friends at 3 so I threw myself out of bed and stumbled into the shower. I take really long showers, so when my parents are gone I go mental. I was in there for about 45 minutes on my phone scrolling through Reddit and Twitter and whatnot, when I heard my front door open. The bathroom is directly up the stairs from the back door, and the thing is pretty loud when it opens and closes. I immediately froze, since obviously I was supposed to be alone. I waited for about 2 minutes, ears trained and trying to hear anything else. Nothing. I figured it was just the wind or maybe my parents were home early, so I turned off the shower, wrapped my towel around myself and slowly walked down the stairs to check it out. So the stairs to the kitchen, where the back door is, are pretty tight and walled in, so it's essentially like walking down a tighter version of this but replacing the rail with a wall. So I can't see into the kitchen when I walk down. Even though my house is old as hell, and each step on the stairs makes a super loud creak, I still took my time and tried to be as quiet as possible. I probably took 45 seconds walking down all 12 of the stairs. So when I get to the second to last stair, right before I could see around the corner into the kitchen, I take a little breath to compose myself. In my mind I knew I was being stupid, there obviously wasn't anything in the kitchen, there's no way I wouldn't have heard another noise and there's no reason for them to still be in the kitchen even if there were burglars or something in the house. After sort of mentally chastising myself for being such a wuss, I sort of chuckle to myself for being so stupid and just normally walk the last two stairs and turn the corner into the kitchen. Standing about two feet away from me in the middle of my kitchen is a man staring straight at me, perfectly still, with a massive smile across his face. Just staring at me. The thing I remember most vividly wasn't his face or his smile but his arms, they weren't just at his side, he held them in the strangest most aborn model position I've ever seen. They were where one would normally hold their arms, but he had rotated them to the point where they were almost completely reversed as well as lifting them up and a little behind himself. I don't know why I remember this so much but it's just the most demonic abnormal position I've ever seen. Honest to God I think I almost had a heart attack right there. Looking back I can realize how fucking creepy this situation was, but in the moment I just took a step towards him and punched him as hard as I could in the jaw, sort of half slapping and pushing him towards the ground. The second I connected, I beelined up the stairs, dropping my towel in the kitchen with my heart beating out of control. I sprinted into my room and locked the door behind me. I quickly put a chair up against the doorknob like you see in TV. Almost without thinking I immediately called 911 and, nearly in tears, told the operator what happened. As I sat on the floor of my room, in practically the fetal position, staring at the door praying that a cop would be here soon I noticed the light coming from the gap between my door had stopped. The man was standing outside of my door. There's no words to describe the feeling I had, I was paralyzed with fear watching the shadow across the bottom of the door shift in tiny ways. I stayed balled up, staring at the gap, praying the man would go away for what seemed like an hour. All the while, the 911 operator was asking, Hello. Sir, sir are you there? Hello? I didn't want to make a noise, and even if I wanted to move my arms to bring the phone to my mouth I don't think I could have. Eventually the light returned to the gap and I heard the faintest of footsteps, slowly creaking the wooden floorboards as he walked down the hall. It was silent for minutes as I just sat there curled up, unable to even speak. I heard banging on the front door and the sound of two officers entering my house. I finally felt safe, and I opened the door to the two of them standing there, I almost cried. Nowadays my parents don't even leave me home alone anymore, thank God, and I check every lock on the house before going to bed. I still get nightmares occasionally, and my heart starts racing whenever I see someone standing still, but I'm doing alright. Even working with sketch artists and a few lineups, the police never found whoever was in my house. That sends shivers down my spine every time I look outside, half expecting to see him standing across the street smiling under a lamp post. 
I have no idea what he wanted, or who he was, but regardless, let's not meet, ever again. Sorry for the length, I've never typed it out before but it feels good to share this with other people. If anyone's interested, I could provide pictures of the things I tried to describe, minus the man in the kitchen of course, like where I was sitting in my room, the kitchen, and the bathroom. Holodomor My great-grandmother was born in 1913 in Ukraine. In 1932, when she was 19, something called Holodomor took place, extermination by hunger. This was recognized years later as genocide on Ukrainian people by the Soviet Union. Millions died. And as you might expect during a famine cannibalism became rampant. It wasn't unheard of, great-grandma told me, for families to kill the youngest child in order to eat. As time passed and the famine ended, things seemed to get better, but food was still scarce. It cost a lot just for the basics, milk, eggs, bread, etc. It also took a lot of time as these things weren't easy to find. Though it happened less, great-grandma was certain that people were resorting to easier, more sinister methods to obtain food. Great-grandma was pregnant with my grandfather in 1936, and she wanted fresh vegetables desperately. Sort of a pregnancy craving, I guess you could say. So out she went, trekking up and down the streets. It looks like she wasn't going to have any luck until lady, you need something? It was a small boy, about 8 years old. His cheeks were unusually full, she remembered. Most people those days had cheekbones that looked like they would poke out from your face at any slight pressure. Great grandma told the boy she wanted vegetables, and his chubby face split into a grin. He knew just the place, he told her, and gave her directions to a hovel a few blocks down. She was worried, but determined. So off she went. The hovel smelled like slaughter. She didn't think anything of it. Maybe these people had a lot of food, and she had struck a gold mine. Perhaps they would take sympathy on a pregnant woman and not charge her an astronomical price for a droopy carrot. When she pushed the curtain acting as a door aside and said hello, three things happened simultaneously. There was a man with a plank of wood raised above his head coming towards her, she caught sight of a human head laying on the table, causing her to scream, and a woman in the corner shouted Kton. Which means, stop. The woman examined my grandmother, frowning at her stomach. The boy knows we have standards. We don't kill pregnant women. Go, leave. Do not repeat what you saw. We can change our minds. Great grandma didn't need to be told that again. She left, and came to America years later to start a cannibalism free life. I still wonder what would have happened had they not noticed she was pregnant. He smells like garbage. He knows where I sleep. He wants to eat me. This is gonna be long, but it's worth it, I promise. I was working at a sports bar in the morning and a big dirty fella sat down in my section. He had shoulder length wild hair and dirty torn clothing, you know, typical loony garb. But I'm a good waitress, I don't plan on treating him any different than any other customer. So I greet him and I'm instantly hit with the smell of garbage. I grew up neglected and abused, which is important for a few reasons, some of which come into play later. 1. I know what it's like to be judged and I empathize and overcompensate when I deal with someone I think has also been wrongfully judged. 2. My parents were creepy hoarders, so the smell of garbage, garbage and BO together especially, gives me anxiety attacks. 3. Because of the abuse and some other trauma, I have severe PTSD, this sports bar was the last job I was able to hold, which means I'm always on high alert and high sensitive to my surroundings and possible threats. I think in terms of defense always, especially concerning my home. So, even though the smell of this man was skyrocketing my anxiety, I treated him well. I figured he was down on his luck, he came in on all you can eat taco bar day and stayed for 5 hours and I figured he hadn't eaten much lately, which struck a personal chord with me because our parents didn't feed us and we often went days without food. I felt so so sorry for him, so I went above and beyond when serving him. He obviously appreciated it, and he left, nothing unusual. He returned the next week and requested me. This time he had brought some emails he printed out between him and his ex and asked me if I could read them and explain some of the things his ex said since I was a girl. I told him I would read it when I wasn't working, which I had no intention of doing, and I took him and shoved him in my purse. From the emails I could see his name was Steve. He later asked what days and shifts I worked, and I lied through my teeth. He started asking other personal questions too, 
and I'm used to this, I've waited table for 8 years at this point and dealt with a fair bit of creepers, so I have a whole fabricated life story on deck designed to deter any funny business. Stuff like my boyfriend is a giant with anger issues, I have nosy neighbors, etc. I remember that the only true thing I ever told him was that my sister worked at Subway and I accidentally mentioned her name. I remember vividly because I had a very strong gut feeling that I shouldn't say it. I wish I had listened to that feeling. A week later during one of my night shifts, Steve comes in and he was pissed. He demanded to know why I wasn't working when I said I was. I said I had traded a lot of shifts recently, Steve got super close to me and exclaimed that I better be here next time and he left. A cook told me he had seen that guy sleeping in his car in the parking lot that morning and he had seen the same car parked in the lot several times when he left at night. He knows it was the same car because it was filled with trash. Steve came back in after last call and told me he wanted to place an order, but I said it was too late, so he went to the bathroom. I watched for him to leave and he never did, at this point I have a panic attack building, I tell the bartender and manager what's going on, and him and the bouncer find him standing on the toilet in the stall. They drag him out and tell him he can never come back. I told my boyfriend, so when he picked me up he brought two friends and I discreetly hide my face and disguised myself when I left, checking the mirrors to see if we were being followed. Steve never came back, and I ended up quitting shortly after anyway. Eventually my boyfriend and I broke up and I kept our apartment and had my sister move in. A few months later, things took a turn for the worst. I started dating my girlfriend who was from a small town, and she wanted to take a weekend trip back home. When we got back, one of the window panes was busted in a multiple paned window and I asked my sister about it and she hadn't noticed. She hadn't left the house all weekend, and she didn't hear glass breaking or anything suspicious. This did not feel like a break-in attempt, and the more we thought about it, the scarier it became. 1. We were dead broke, there's nothing you could get any money from inside, trust me, I've tried, and it's evident no matter what window you look in from. Like I said, I think defense, so all the windows have blinds but there are a few gaps in them from the cats, I have looked through these gaps multiple times to be completely aware of what can and cannot be seen. Also I put long screws in all the window frames so they can't be opened more than 4 to 6 inches. 2. The window pane was pried out, not busted in, meaning they knew someone was home and they didn't want to be heard. 3. It was the only night in over a year that I left town. I didn't put it on Facebook and I only told a few good friends. Neither my sister and I have cars, so you can't look in the driveway and see who's home. The next night, we heard the neighbor's dogs barking and growling and we heard footsteps in the yard. I grabbed the gun, went to the living room next to the yard and listened, thinking to myself be smart, is this two feet or four, and the second I realized it was bipedal, I started flipping the lights on and off rhythmically to make the person think we were signaling our neighbor. That made him leave. Sign for it wasn't a break-in attempt, you don't return to the house you failed to break into the day before. My sister and I got tasers and wasp spray, it's cheaper than pepper spray and sprays farther because I don't have a CNC and my sister won't touch a gun. The rest of the week was quiet and my sister was now armed, so that weekend my girlfriend and I decided to go out. We got in a stupid fight that night, and when she dropped me off, I threw $20 in her car and said something snarky like here's my half of the tab and went inside. She noticed when she was a few blocks away, and texted she was gonna come give it back but I told her not to. She knocked but I didn't answer because I was mad. I heard footsteps come up to my bedroom window and I waited for her to knock on the window so I could yell that I told her not to come by but she just walked off. She texted to say she tucked the $20 in the screen door, so I got up to grab it and there was nothing there. I told her it wasn't there and asked if it could have fallen out and it wasn't possible. Then I asked why she walked to my window and she hadn't. This meant whoever saw her leave the money had to be 50 feet or less from the door, it had only been 3 minutes tops from when she dropped it off to when I checked and the only place that could have been was in our backyard. It also means whoever walked up to my window knew my girlfriend was there to see me and knew which room was mine. A week later we heard footsteps in the yard again. I did the same routine, grabbed the gun, stood in the living room then started with the lights. Then I had an idea, this person needs to think they can be seen, so I started to flip the switch every time I heard a step. Once they noticed they started running, so I ran to look out the peephole to see a big fellow with wild hair running down the alley. Even though I didn't get a great look, the general outline looked like Steve. So I start looking for the emails he gave me. Like I said, I'm always on high alert and he raised concern, 
The second I noticed his full name was on the emails I decided I was going to keep them. I get his last name and searched his public record, then I pulled up his most recent mugshot and asked my sister if she had seen the man before, and her face went ghost white. She said yes, he smelled like garbage and that made her anxious too. He came into her job, Subway, a few times, but every time he came in he asked her lots of questions. She said she will never forget the creepy menacing smile he plastered on his face the second she told him her name and the feeling of pure fear it gave her. She rides her bike to and from work, so I'm betting he followed her home. One thing became painfully clear, he didn't hurt my girlfriend when she left the money, he didn't touch my sister when she rode her bike home, this was about me. The second she told me this, I called the cops. I gave them the emails and told them everything I knew down to the name of the cook I knew could describe his car. They found his car within a week, it was abandoned by the lake. It was full of trash, a few personal belongings and pages of his crazy thoughts and intentions. There were hundreds of pages about me and what he thought he knew about me, my sister, a checklist of all the subways he checked to find her, what he learned from her, the layout of our house, my girlfriend's info and, the most messed up. His very sexually charged plan to keep me alive while he cut me up and ate me. The plan was to break in, kill my sister and wait for me to come home, then he was going to cut off a piece of me a day and make me watch while he ate it and jerked off. In less than 24 hours the cops found his body in the lake. I had PTSD before this happened, so did my sister, and this event made it so much worse for us. My sister can't work either now, and we are both in the disability process. I debated posting this for a long 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 time, I don't like thinking and talking about it and it gives me panic attacks sometimes. It literally has taken me 6 hours to write it all out. But I decided it's a story worth telling, I'll never get over it if I keep avoiding it, and maybe, hopefully, it will help save someone else's life, so be kind with the comments. Thanks for reading. Thanks for listening to Radio TTS. Hit the subscribe button for more videos about strangers wanting to eat people. Share your thoughts about these stories in the comments below.